So welcome everyone to the first of a series of podcasts exploring Welsh research funded by the Health and Care um, Research Wales, focusing on exploring the experience of young people who have experienced local authority care across Wales. I'm Carol Davis, I'm a researcher and a lecturer at Bangor University in North Wales, and I'm the project lead for the research. Hello, I'm Louise Prendergast and I'm a postdoctoral researcher working at Bangor University. I'm working alongside Carol, who's leading the project, and my role includes reviewing the literature, what's already known about um, young people who are care leavers, and conducting interviews with young people and people working within the services. Hi, my name's Shona Doan, and I'm a leading care officer for Gwynedd 16 Plus team. Hi, I'm Amy Sinclair. I am the leaving care project team leader, Dengista, and the senior personal advisor within the Gwynedd 16 Plus team. And if I can come to you, Eva? I'm a care leaver from Conway County. And Kayla? Hi, I'm Kayla, and I'm a care leaver from Torvine. Thank you very much for everyone to be part of this podcast. And as I mentioned, this is the first of a series of podcasts, which is called Moving Up, Summidivani in Welsh. And this is very much Welsh research across Wales. So it's lovely to have you all here today to discuss this important research um, with me. The first thing I wanted to, to kind of discuss was the research is really focusing on how we work with how we engage with care leavers across Wales and what are some of the barriers and what are some of the positive aspects of engaging with professionals. So the first question I wanted to explore was around what do we mean when we're talking about working with professionals? What's really easy about that and what's really maybe a bit difficult about working with professionals? What's easy about it? Yeah. I suppose it's the support, knowing that you have someone to talk to. It was that easy, thinking that. I suppose the difficulties about it is um, how many you can work with. So, it can, you know, you, you don't work with the same individual constantly. There can be multiple people. That's multiple people you have to get to know again, open up to again. That makes complete sense, Kayla. So all the different workers that you can work with. And and I'm just wondering, is, is that similar to what you see in practice, um, Shaned and Amy? Yeah, I think it's um, the social care is known for a high volume turnover of staff, you know, so it's not necessarily a case of that you'd have the same person advisor or the same social worker throughout your journey within care or leaving care which is, I can imagine is nothing but frustrating for, you know, any young person that's receiving support. You know, I know over the years, you know, working in the field that a lot of young people get quite frustrated about the turnovers of staff and the difference, different workers that pop in and out of their lives. I think what is difficult within that as well is that, you know, because you're in a certain field doesn't necessarily always mean that you have to put stuff on hold. You know, you've got your personal life, you know, the same as a young person's life involves, you know, a member of staff's lives involves as well within that, isn't it? So it's difficult to get the balance. I'm a strong believer in consistency is key, but it's not always possible in every aspect, is it? But it's definitely what happens in practice. You know, we see it every day. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and is that similar to your perspective or are there any differences that you've seen, Seanad? I've been quite fortunate in that I've stayed in a role for quite a number of years and I feel like that has been quite important to a young person because they build that trust and you're part of their story, you're part of their memories and their identity because you remember things that have happened that have been quite significant in their life. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think is good practice is being able to give them some kind of memory book after you've done a piece of work with them when you when when your kind of journey comes to an end. But I think Gwynedd in general uh, is, is something that they strive for is consistency and wherever possible the consistency for that young person and looking at each young person individually and what is best for them as an individual. 
Yeah, thanks for your views. And, and kind of just coming back to your reflection, Kyla, around that consistency. Have you had any workers that have been working with you consistently? Um, yeah, my, my PA, my YPA, she's been with me now for about three years. So she's been the longest worker I've had. And having that worker for that period of three years, has that been different for you? Yes, because I, because I know that she knows everything that's going on, so I don't have to keep explaining everything to her. So, yeah, it really helps a lot. <laughs> and, you know, it's important as part of the discussion that you're kind of sharing that that's really helpful for you, that that's shared and that we can kind of share that with people who are listening to the podcast around that importance of consistency and building that relationship. And if I can come to you, Eva, around your experiences, are they similar or are they different? Uh, I guess a similar fact of I've got uh, one PA, she's been absolutely amazing and I've had her since I turned 18 could not say a bad thing about it, but when I was younger, I would bounce around a lot with different social workers. I've had it very hard to settle with, like, trying to open up to just one because I had a new one every week. Yeah, and as you've just kind of mentioned that those challenges around opening up and, Kayla, you mentioned around that challenge of repeating your story to several people. Can I bring you into the discussion here, Louise, around... From the research that you've been doing around what you've been looking at in the international literature on this point, have you kind of identified um, any themes around what um, Eva and Kayla have been discussing around their experiences here? Yeah, we scope the literature, the um, international literature, to have an understanding of what some of the barriers, what made it difficult for care leavers to engage with services and some of the enablers, what made it a bit easier for people to engage with services and very much what's been said already um, person-centered approaches um, a flexible approach which was tailored to the young people was seen as enabling support continuity of support was really important in the literature it contributed to young people to participate in services with support being offered for as long as possible without the fear of it being stopped and trust was very important as well so the young person felt that they had to be able to establish trust with a professional and that could take time that's great i'm kind of building on that theme of trust can i come to you first amy and shauna how do you work with young people to kind of build that trust I think it's about giving time to get to know them and letting maybe opening up you know letting them get to know you a little bit as well I think that's really important you know so that barrier of you know young person professional isn't solid sort of thing you know that you do have open discussions like okay so what sort of films do you like you know get to know that young person but allowing them to get to know you as well as a person I think that's something that I've always found you know in my role um, that helps with young people and being patient, being patient with time. Don't expect them to open up and tell you their whole life story and any difficulties, any struggles that they're having on your first meeting. You know, you you need to trust them that when they're ready, they will come to you. I think the trust works both, both ways in it as well, you know. If you're patient and consistent with them, I think it develops over time. And, and Seanad, what about your experiences? Yeah, I agree with Amy that, you know, trust is something very important and that it, you, you do have to work on getting somebody's trust. And um, I think the important things for me is that you, they're able to have their voice heard and you are there to help ensure that their voice is heard and they are feel listened to. And for me personally, more than anything, they do feel cared for because they are important. They are an in, individual and get to know them as a person not just reading a file but them as an individual and as a person and being respectful really to them especially as they turn 18 they have uh, rights to make their own uh, choices and decisions to make mistakes in their life it doesn't mean that it's the end um, and that you are there not to replace 
a parent, but to be there for them as a parent would. They're not giving up and sticking with them in there when they celebrate and when they, you know, when things are not going so great. So, yeah, the, I think that also links in with the trust part in that you are there as consistent person. No, that's great. Thanks, Seanette. I'm kind of coming to to um, Ivan, Kayla, around your experiences. Have you felt that you've had the opportunity to build a trustful relationship with with the workers that you've you've had supporting you? Yes, definitely. But the one I got now, my um, PA, obviously I've had it for three years. It took me a very long time to um, actually meet her. To be honest, we we emailed for a lot because I weren't ready to like meet her or anything. But um, after like about six months, maybe maybe a bit less, I ended up trusting her a lot more. And now she's like the first person I go to for anything. Like. When I found out that I got my flat a couple of weeks ago, she was the first person I messaged and, you know, she's helped me with everything. So, yeah, I think trust is big and I definitely got that with my current PA. And you've kind of explained that relationship as developing over time, starting with that connection over email and then being kind of, would you describe it as your go-to person? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah, with your go-to person. I've got a flat, you know, key milestone and then that go-to person that you connect with. Yeah, it's pretty much, yeah. Oh, that's, that, that's a really important example for showing that kind of trust and relationship and how that builds over time. Thanks for sharing, Kayla. I really appreciate that. And Eva, what has your experience looked like with regards to that trusting element within relationships? Well, my PA, um, Becky, she was always really lovely when, like, even since she first took on my file from when I was 18. But um, when I first I first started out being 18, I thought, I don't need support from anyone. I can do this on my own. I completely just went MIA for about six months. My foster guy didn't know where I was. My PA didn't know where I was. My phone was broken. Nobody, nobody, nobody knew where I was. And then one time I just thought, I'm like, you know what? I need help. I am not doing this rodeo on my own anymore. I am not doing a good job of what I'm doing. I am miserable and I'm just tired of it. So I, mess- I messaged her back and then she like she phoned me and she was like, right, we'll do a phone call tomorrow just to see how things can get on. But she's been lovely to me since day one. I had no reason to hate her, but it was just me being headstrong and 18 like that, I can do everything on my own, go off into the world and do my own thing. But I realised after a while, like, I need that support. <laughs> but because she stuck with it, she didn't just thought, oh, this shit. she'd message me every day, three days a week, when she was in, she'd like, right, I'm here if you need me, here if you need me, and here if you need me. And that perseverance, like, I will trust her. I'll trust her with anything. And like Kayla said, with her flat, any little thing that happens, I'm like, look, I got this. I've done stuff. Like she she'd been nagging me to get my ID sorted for four years and I finally got it sorted this year and she goes, Alright, I'm gonna buy you a coffee then. Ah <laughs> she's like, it's about damn time. <laughs> yeah. And and you've kind of touched on really important points there around perseverance, patience, you know, kind of the themes that Louise was discussing from the literature as well, and building that relationship over time. One key point that Louise raised from the literature was having that kind of person-centred support. And if I can, again, kind of come to, to both of you, Eva and, and Kayla, around do you feel that you've had that person-centred um, support? Yeah. Yeah. And also, on the other side, are there any examples where you feel that that support hasn't been person-centred? Um, I'd say the only time I'd say that kind of stuff's happening is when she's on annual leave. Your, the duty PA system is shambles. Like, just try... The phone number changes every day. First of all, in my county, I don't know if it's the same everywhere else. Phone number changes every day, so you tell me I've got to ring up to get the actual number, ring the office, and then get this phone number. Okay, I'll try and ring them. They're always busy, so they never answer the phone. And then every single day, it's say if you need a problem like solving, like I need help, uh, my gas has gone, like it's gone off, and I don't know what's going on. 
and just need a bit of support trying to sort this out because I don't know what I'm doing. But yeah, you have to talk to every single different person every single time you want to ring. And usually they don't sort it anyway. If you come with a problem, they're like, there's not much we can do. And it's like... Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but it's like um, a lot of PAs don't work on the weekend, so you have to contact out of hours if something can happen. And obviously before living on my own, I was living with other people, and if I were to get kicked out on the weekend, there was nothing I could do about it because they couldn't put me anywhere, so they just basically tell you, you know have a cup of tea your work will be in monday or something like that so that's like yeah the only time is when they're not in work if i ever hear someone say just have a cup of tea again in my goddamn life i swear Ooh. so so that kind of advice is no i don't need a cup of tea actually no yeah. i need help <laughs> you need that help you need that support and kind of a key message i'm hearing is around consistency and is around that flexible support. And you kind of mentioned, Kayla, around having that support as well, kind of out of hours. That's really kind of important to hear those messages. And linking in with, with your roles, Amy and Seanette, is that consistency and that flexible support, including out of hours, something that you kind of come across? We do have our mobiles, which all young people have our mobile numbers to get hold of us um we also have a facebook page and um we have an app that has any numbers that they would need to be able to contact for lots of different agencies um should there be an emergency so it's a signposting kind of information place that young people should be able to get the help and support they need from the app in any given situation. And is that something that, that you've got access to, Eva and Kayla, around having that kind of flexible support through the apps or useful out-of-hours numbers? No. I don't believe that I have that. Obviously, my, my work has got a mobile, we've got her number, but obviously when she's on leave, she tends to obviously switch her work phone off because, you know, she's out of work. But like I said, we have out-of-hours they're not the great, like they're not the best, to be honest. So that flexible support is really important. And you were giving some options there, Sean, Ed, around maybe how that flexible support can be kind of catered um, and how that can be provided. And, and Amy, is there anything that you'd like to add there around that flexible support? No, I think I agree with Sean, Ed. I think, you know, from our perspective, I think most workers, especially within our team at Gwynedd, I think we do our very best to provide, you know, that flexibility to young people, you know. I find it really interesting listening to, you know, Kayla and Eva around that topic because it's a different perspective, you know, listening to it from young people. I know I practice a case of, yes, you know, if I'm still on a visit at five o'clock, I don't turn to a young person and go, sorry, my working hours are over. I'll stay there for as long as they need me to stay there. I'll travel across the country to see them if that's what they want, if that's what they need from me going back to that person-centered approach I think in any role and any job I think it's impossible to have one person doing working seven days a week and I'm sure Eva and Kayla absolutely appreciate that you know they clearly think very highly of their YPA and it's really good to hear I guess that's why stuff like out of hours you know duty and stuff is available like Shauna touched on you know in Gwynedd we do have the apps as well with relevant numbers that young people are able to use and, you know, signpost on to if for any reason that, you know, their work is not available. But I think flexibility is important and I think a lot of people try their best with that as well, yeah. No, that that makes, yeah, that makes complete sense. And I think your views, Sean Ed and, and Amy, really links in with um, what Kayla and um, Eva were explaining about their experiences. And you've clearly highlighted the positives with, with both your PAs, but it's really also important to listen to what aspects of services need to be developed and improved. Um, and kind of coming to you, Louise, based on maybe what you've revealed in the literature, but also I know that you've been interviewing young people. Is there anything 
something that you've kind of um, read or something that you've heard from the young people around that person-centred support and also that flexible support? Yeah, so um, definitely the person-centred support is has, has come across as being really important because you're getting to know that individual and obviously the young person is getting to know the professional staff member the social worker or the PA so it works both ways it's a both people need to get to know each other and then and you know obviously not one size fits all and also it's that patience and the consistency and persistency as well because as was spoken about earlier young people might not feel that they want to engage with a service at a particular time so you just need to know that that support's there and so the literature discusses transformational moments of realization by young people that actually I do want to engage with the service now therefore that service has to be there the support has to be there and um, workers obviously need to have that persistence and patience. And you've just mentioned that transformational support and that's something that you've kind of explained, Eva, around that milestone of changing 18 and then reaching that point of when you kind of made that decision for yourself, I I want and need support now. Is that something um, that, that anyone else has seen or experienced, you know, that kind of milestone of 18 and that transformational point? To be fair, I've been pretty open with all the support, even when I did turn 18. I suppose when I turned 18, I still had the same PA. So my PA got introduced to me when I was 17 or 16-ish. So she was obviously still my PA when I turned 18. I'm 19 now, and obviously she's still my PA. So I didn't really, I was still accepting the support from her when turning 18. But I, I, I did go a bit more independent with stuff. And do you mind if I ask you, Kayla, around that introduction of your PA before you turned 18, did that make a difference to you? When I got introduced to my PA, I was getting introduced to loads of people at the same time. You know, like I said um, before, it, it took me a while to actually, you know, let her in. But at, at the same time, I, I was getting introduced to, like, new social workers as well, and, and then obviously my PA, and then other things were going on so I suppose it was it it was a good time when she did come in because it it probably was the toughest time so it was good when she came in when she did and not when I did turn 18 but yeah well thanks for sharing that experience Kayla I really appreciate And, and listening to to your views is really important as Amy was saying you know we we've we work in a professional role, but it's more than that professional role. It's that support, it's that building that relationship, as Louise was saying, with persistency and patience over time. And Eva, around that kind of experience for you, was it similar or was it different to Kayla's experiences? So I did, I had a normal social work up until my 18th birthday, and then my PA took over from there. But there was like a six months period where my social worker would come, I'd like, say, come do a visit. But then my PA would come at the same time. So they'd both be there to come do the home visits to make sure we're good. We all have a chat in the living room. Then we always went to the bedroom so we can have like our own chat and then go back down. Or what? She'll write some stuff down, she'll leave. And then she kind of just like sat in and watched how that was all going on. I guess that was to kind of get me used to her there because I'm. I'm a big, that was a big thing about change with me growing up. Like, I don't do change. I don't like change. I don't like things being different. When I got told that I was going to get somebody different than my social worker, I kicked off, sort of thing. Even though I didn't even like my social worker. I hate them. But just the thought that something was going to change, I was like, no, I'm in it. But then I turned 18 and everything changed. So I was like, everything will go. I didn't want to know anybody. I thought I could do everything. So I was like, no way, I can do it by myself. But I learned very quickly, I can't do everything by myself. When you're 18, you are not invincible. You do not rule the world. If you get offered help, take the help. I think you've given some really important advice there. 
I think I can also put my hand up and think when I was 18, I felt that I was invincible and quickly learned that I wasn't. So, and it's that turning point. And was there anything in particular that kind of really made that turning point for you, Eva, around, right, I, I'm, I'm going to, I want and I need support now? Well, I was, uh, so I, I said I'd gone MIA for a good six months. Nobody knew where I was. My phone was broken, so I couldn't contact anybody. I was living with, by that point, he was my ex-partner, but we were together. I was staying in his flat, and things were just miserable. I was basically a chambermaid. All I did was clean, and I lived above where I worked. So I'd work downstairs, then go back up to the flat. I would have finished my shift. Or how would break loose because I'll argue him because I haven't done the dishes. Or I haven't done a load of laundry. Or I haven't done this, and I haven't done this. And I haven't done that. And then they were like, all oh, right, well, do you want to, because he was my manager, I was like, well, do you want to give me my wages then? And then I think about it. So it caused a lot of strain on the relationship. So enough that we did end up breaking up, but we, I still lived with him for a good two months. So I was like, look, I'm miserable. I've not registered with the GP. I don't know how to do it. I'm unwell. I've got this going on with me. I had septic pneumonia at the time. So I, I couldn't do anything with myself. So I was like, right, I'm going to sort my life out. I'm sick of Physically and emotionally being in pain, I am completely sick of going hungry every day. I'm sick of the flat with being cold because I can't afford it. I'm going to sort it out. And the first step was moving out of his house. So that changing relationships. Yeah. And that would have taken a lot of strength to make that change. Um, 100%. And, you know, thanks for sharing that experience around that change and kind of linking in with that transfer, transformational change of 18. Shana and Amy, is that something that you've seen in practice? Absolutely, I'd say. I think, you know, over the years, I think it's really important, I believe, to try and get, you know, your PA introduced before they turn 18. Again, just to build that relationship up slowly, give time, that they're not an unfamiliar person and that it's not 18, no social work, 18 PA, if that makes sense. But definitely, I think I think we're all guilty of it, you know, turning 80. And again, like you said as well, Keryl, I, I thought I was invincible when I was 18. I didn't need help. I didn't need this. I could do it all myself. I'm an adult now. But again, I think that's why it is important to maybe introduce your PA earlier on, just so that if that does happen, and then six months later, a year later, that young person feels comfortable enough to come back to your men. I'm really sorry, this has happened, can you help me please? I think it's really important that that's available. I know I've experienced it in practice a lot. And that, but, and I think it's important for a young person to know that it's okay if that's what happens as well. It's okay if you want to take a step back from me, I appreciate that you want to live your life your way. Just know I am here if and when you need me at the end of it. That's, I think that's what's important. No, that's great, thanks. Thanks, Amy. And Seanad? What's about your experiences of this? Yeah, I I feel that it's all uh, we try and look what's going on for that young person or what suits that young person with the introduction and the the timing of that, really. Because I think it can be overwhelming. Like Kayla has said, she had a lot of different people at that time in her life when she was being introduced. And, you know, it is a big transition for young people in care when they turn 18 and sometimes in I do feel that um, as care leavers they have to grow up quicker and take responsibilities that other young people don't have to have necessarily if they live within their secure family and decisions that are tough to make as well at a young age where will you live what will you do all these different things they are big decisions that um make a path for you the way your life goes so yeah i think i think a transition is is massive when you're a young person leaving care so to speak and i fully admire them and i feel like they are incredible young people and i really feel privileged to support them in my role yeah. Oh, it's lovely to hear that, Shannon, and I would really fully agree with you. From my background in social work, I agree, you know, admire that kind of really um, robustness and the 
the kind of strength it takes around really making key changes in your life at an accelerated or at an earlier age. As Sean was saying, around that acceleration, having to grow up faster, having to make really key life-changing decisions at an earlier age, is that something that you felt and experienced at all? Yes, a lot, a lot. Even, like, way before 16 as well. But before I ended up going into the care system, my living arrangements, I was technically the parent, let's say, in my household. So that was hard enough at the age of 14 but then when I left um and then went in like into the care system I still obviously I I only moved with one of my siblings and I still felt that responsible parent role for them and then you know having to decide then if I wanted to stay where I was staying or if I wanted to go somewhere else and then deciding about my education as well um where to go what to do for that and then, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, a lot. So a lot, and, and key decisions as well, Kayla. And, and is that very similar or different for you, Eva? Growing up in the care system, I didn't really have that many responsibilities. It Because it, the background we came from, I, d- I don't know anything other than the care system. Like, I, was too, I was too young, I don't remember anything. I, know, I also know who my parents are, and I remember some little, like, snippets like Christmas or a birthday or but I don't remember much I, I don't know like care, care life has been my normal yeah which is very strange when I explain it to other people because I'm, I'm so like oh yeah I've been in care my whole life but everyone else is like oh oh it must be so sad are you okay and I'm like yeah I'm fine we want more <laughs> but if anything I was guaranteed a roof over my head and food in my stomach and the heating bills on so positives yeah. Positives, yeah. And they, I was lucky they did move me with my twin sister as well, because I, I know full well if they split us up, my mum would have caused hell. She caused hell anyway. But <laughs> well, I've really enjoyed listening to um, the research, the professional, and also that kind of everyday lived experiences of this topic of how do we engage with young people effectively um, to offer that support in a person-centred way. And, And what I've kind of heard from the discussion today is around that importance of trust, persistence, consistency, and that really building that that relationship. So just as a final point now, I'd really like to come to everyone individually and and just see what kind of key advice would you like to give other care leavers around how what the, what they le- need to look look for in a really good professional relationship. What advice do you want to give to the professionals out there? And if I can come to you first, Amy, if that's okay. Sure. Oh. Be patient. 100% be patient with it be consistent with what you're giving them you know the advice that you're giving them and the support that you're offering and I think if you if you are willing to be patient and give that consistency I think yeah you could go far that's great thanks um, Amy Seanad I think for me is that um, determination and not to give up on that young person no matter what um that you can be that support for them in helping them succeed in life. And that trust is very important and key to that. Brilliant. Thanks, Seanad. That's brilliant. And Louise? Um, well, something that's come across in the interviews is um, the feeling that uh, you're being listened to. So some young people have been saying, well, if I'm not being listened to, what's the point of me talking? Um, and then they might just switch off if they don't feel like they're being listened to. That's great. Thanks, Louise. And if I can come to you, um, Eva. Just give your PA or somebody a chance to help you before you decide, oh, it's not worth speaking to this person. Just just sit it out a year. Give them a year. If it doesn't work out, you know it's not working out, Try then try somebody else. But try for a year. Okay, so I think that's sound advice, Eva. And if I can come to you, Kayla? Um, pretty much the same as Eva. Just give it, you know, give your PA a chance and 
accept the support when you know it's there. That's lovely. Thank you, everyone. That's sound advice around that giving a chance and persistency, trust and relationships, listening relationships. Thank you very much for listening to our podcast today. Do look out for our next podcast, which will be further exploring this research project across Wales, which is exploring the barriers and the enablers to engagement with young people who are care leavers. Thank you. This research is led by Bangor University in partnership with our fantastic partners from Gista, Gwynedd County Council, Conwy County Borough Council, Ynys Morn Council and Torvain Council. And we would like to thank Health and Care Research Wales for funding this All Wales research. <laughs>